We're going to talk for the next little while about writing. So it's a nice lead out from Lisa's talk with us to what I'd like to talk about. Here's the little book that Larry was talking about. It's 32 pages, and it has a lot of very nice red in it to help you maneuver through it. And what I'd like to do in the next little while is take you through it, highlight some of the content, and uh, uh, inspire you, I hope, to be writers and te good teachers of writing. These are the seven stages that we looked at in the writing process. Of course, the final one is writing it right. And that's a culmination of all of the others. Writing it, getting it right, getting grammar right, getting sentences right, spelling right, and getting punctuation right. But we need to start somewhere. We need to get things in order when we're going to write. And the first thing, of course, is what to write. What do you write about? Hmm. And for those of you who do some writing, you know this happens. You start, you stop, you start, you stop, you start, you stop, all over again, one after the other. And so in the book, we talk about getting started, and we suggest that it's usually best to write about what you know, because when you know something about the topic, your focus can then be on getting your message across and not on wondering if you know enough about the topic to write about it. So we're actually going to do a little bit of writing very fast, but here we go. What I'd like you to do on that sheet that's in the handout on the second sheet, and you'll see that most wonderful quote by James Moffat that says, to render experience into words is the real business of schools. I'm going to ask you in just a moment to create a nugget list of up to five things you know or know about. For example, somewhere you've been, an experience you've had, an opinion you hold. A nugget list is simply a point form list. The first few ideas that come to your mind, and if you would do that now, go. To get us writing, I'd like to introduce you vicariously to Dr. Frank Green, Professor Emeritus from Faculty of Education, McGill University. And once upon a time, he invented a writing program that he called SWISH, and that means Silent Writing Intensive Sustained Habit. Or, as a young grade two student once told me, she said, I think SWISH means silent writing in school hours. <laughs> and I thought that was excellent because she obviously knew how to spell hours with an H, right? So here's what we need to do. Grab your pen, or I see some of you are using uh, computers. Can you open a new page in your word processing program? And we're going to start with the section in the book called Writing It. For the next minute, only a minute because of time constraints, I'm going to ask you to write continuously on your asterisk topic. And you have that handout page you can write on there or on a file card, wherever you like. Here's the rule. We write in silence. Remember, silent writing, intensive, sustained habit. The pen should not leave the page. It keeps moving across the page. You keep writing on your topic. And if you're using a computer, your fingers shouldn't stop from keying in your ideas. But if you run out of thoughts before the minute is up, just write that idea. I've run out of thoughts. I've run out of thoughts. OK? But stick to your topic for as long as you can. All you know about, all you care about, all you're thinking about on that topic. Are you ready? One minute. Go. Time's up. <laughs> Thank you. So just stop your writing. You've done a great job. Terrific. Now we're going to move to the next stage. Obviously, we're moving really fast through this, and you understand, right? We're going to begin the process of getting it right with the um, ultimate goal of writing it right. So we're going to look at 
the revision stage, revising. What is revision? Well, this is when we make sure we've got our ideas in the right order. This is the stage of the writing process when we make meanings clear. And when we reduce ambiguities. Most of the writing that we do, most of the writing that the students do in our classroom, most of it goes through the revision process. And particularly as we follow through in this book, because this book was written for two audiences. One audience are students in the classrooms beginning at about grades four and five and all the way up, including my students now at York University who are very interested in the content of this particular flip book. As well, it's written for teachers in terms of offering them some review and maybe some mini lessons and some direction for their programs. So revising is really a matter of cutting from here and moving to there, adding and deleting. But we need to be always thinking about why. So a typical place to start the revision process is to remind ourselves of our purpose for the writing. And there are several, including to give information, explain or describe something, tell a story, entertain, amuse, persuade, convince, tell how you feel, get someone to respond to your ideas, give voice to the ideas that are in your imagination. Now what I'd like you to do, if you would, is have a look at what you have written yourself. How many of you think one of the purposes for what you wrote could be to give information? Anyone? Show of hands. Anybody to explain something? To describe? To tell a story? Did anyone try to entertain, tell a story? Did you try to persuade or convince? Anyone? Okay, look, we've got somebody in each of them. To tell how you feel. Did anybody who wrote sort of from an emotional, okay, interesting. How about to get somebody to respond? How about to give a voice to ideas that are in your imagination? Pure fantasy stuff. Okay? Well, different forms of writing are used for different purposes. For example, some of the writing forms that are used to convey information, the writing that Donald Graves and James Britton referred to as transactional writing, include reports, articles, interviews, essays, letters, opinion pieces, etc. And some of the forms used to tell story, expressive writing, if you will, journals, plays, series of letters, song lyrics, and poetry. So it's important to have an understanding of the purpose for our writing because very often the purpose for writing will determine the form. So after students begin the writing and they see what their purpose is, then that may help them to decide on the form that it'll take. For me as a writer and for me as a school teacher, this is always the first step I use and the first step I suggest to the students that they use when they begin to revise their writing. Hearing what you've written. <laughs> there are several suggestions included in the book for ways for us to hear what we've written. And here's one for us to try. Here's what to do. Read what you've written to yourself inside your head. So have a look at what you've written on your page, and I'm going to ask you in a moment to read it to yourself inside your head, but I want you to read it in such a way that although we can't hear each other, because it's silent, you can hear your voice inside your head reading with expression. So you're fairly lifting the words off the page. I call this silent oral reading. Ready? Read it through one time with lots of expression silently. Hear the words. Go.
And here's another idea that I included. I want you to keep that same energy and dynamic that you created when reading aloud silently, and I now want you to read your work aloud. And if you get through before I say stop, just go back to the beginning and start reading it again with lots of expression, lots of dynamic. Are you ready? Have a look at your work. Read it aloud. Go. In both situations as you were reading, when you are reading silently orally, or reading orally silently, and when you were reading aloud, as a writer, you'd want to have your pen in hand because you'll notice maybe you left out a word or you start thinking, oh, I think I want to change that around. You just put a quick arrow on because you're going to go back to that and do some revision. But as you're reading, you're listening to what you've said and trying to figure out, is this meaning clear? Because that's what revision is about. A third idea that I've included in the book, of course, you can guess. You'll find it in Right to Write, and that is that you read your work to someone and ask for their questions and comments. You don't have to use the suggestions other people give you, but they might point out where your writing isn't clear or suggest things you hadn't thought about. So this is what I'd like you to do. Your at elbow partner, if you would, would each of you read your work to each other don't go through the asking questions or giving feedback today because of time limitations, but let's try that so each of you gets an opportunity to read what you wrote to an at elbow partner. Ready? Go. How many of you found that your at elbow partner had a different writing voice to yours? How many found your elbow part at elbow partner had a similar writing voice to yours? How many of you found that your at elbow partner wrote on a topic very different to yours? <laughs> very good. Well, the revision process takes lots of time, as do most of the components of the writing process. And this is the stage in which we as writers seek assistance from human and material resources and sources. It's also the time that we might return to the writing forms we've used and a couple of suggestions. Encourage students and through the book, if the students have their own personal copy of the book, we want them to feel encouraged to experiment with a form of writing that they don't often use or have never used before. And the second one that we included that I have never tried as a, a teacher in a classroom, but I know it would work, and I really like the idea, is to consider changing one form of writing to another. So for example, I may have written a personal narrative, and some I writing, but that personal narrative could turn into a play, a poem, a letter to a friend, or even an article for the school newspaper. And I think it's a, a nice idea, if I do say so myself. I haven't used it, but I've come up with it. And, and that's the idea that you can take something you've already written and just transpose it into a different form and let it take on a new life of its own. I'd really like to try that one. So then we move to the next section in the book called Getting It Right. And this is under the subheading of how language works. And this is the editing and the polishing for publication. When writers move into the editing stage, the writing is most likely going to be shared with others. So remember, up to the end of revision is pretty well all of our writing. But when we go beyond that, it means we're really going to be sharing it or publishing it, if you will. And this is the time when we really take a very, very close look. This is the time that the writer looks very, very specifically at elements of his or her writing. So, we include in the editing and polishing for publication, getting grammar right, getting punctuation right, and getting spelling right. And these are the three common components of the editing process, and there are sections for each in Write It Right. The emphasis is on making students aware that correct grammar, punctuation, and spelling help to make meanings clearer. That's why we spell conventionally. That's why we 
punctuate conventionally, we hope. That's why we use grammar and language usage conventionally so that a reader can understand our intent. But sometimes we run into some problems with grammar. And here we are in the next slide as teachers. This is when English teachers snap when they see errors. Sorry, ma'am, but bad grammar is no excuse for vandalism. The poor teacher was up there correcting the sign. I'm always fascinated in punctuation. The most ill-used is the apostrophe. And what I don't get is why can't we be consistent? If we're going to put an apostrophe on the plural of wedding to make it weddings and birthday to birthdays, anniversary to anniversaries, christenings to uh, christening to christenings, why haven't, isn't there an apostrophe on occasions? And cakes, yeah, I missed that one. Like why? I don't get it. Like put it everywhere, right? Did you know this? Punctuation saves lives. I bet you didn't know that. Let's eat grandma. <laughs> what? Let's eat grandma. A comma makes all the difference in the world. But there are a lot of punctuation marks and students need to be exposed to them and to play with them and experiment with them and be helped and directed to use them well. I love this slide because I wonder if they figured out yet or are they thinking job well done? How about that one? <laughs> we know that spelling is difficult. We know it's challenging and we know it's hard. And we have to help students with their spelling because we don't want them to be reduced to only writing the words they know how to spell. And that's the difficulty, isn't it? We want them to use the language they have in their heads that they want to practice using and to play with. So we need to help them through these stages. And how do we do it? We send them to school, and then we have parent nights. You know, it might be, it might have been intentional. I, ho I don't think it was, but maybe it was intentional to get the parents to come to the night to see what goes on. The focus of attention in this section of Write It Right that I really like, however, is this. Writing style, and Lisa was talking about writing style and writer's voice and getting sentences right. We have a section supporting student writers, and this is for teachers, a page. We've included a page of ideas that are focused on ideas and suggestions for helping, encouraging, suggesting, directing, and supporting students through and throughout the writing process. And to help the students keep track of their progress, we've included some recording pages for them. In addition to highlighting, using post-it notes, underlining, and making margin notes in their own personal copies, there are pages on which the students can keep track of the writing forms they use, the punctuation they need to attend to, and what they need to work on in terms of grammar and language usage. So the students can keep an ongoing record of their progress. Now, I, I don't know if any of you know David Booth, but I do. And once upon a time, not so very long ago, he said this. Teaching oracy, which is a, a term that was coined by Andrew Wilkinson, is as important as teaching literacy and numeracy. And I really agree with that. And so in Write It Right, you'll find a lot of opportunities and a lot of encouragements for students to talk 
during their writing experiences. From choosing a topic, deciding on a writing form, revising, editing, proofing, all the way to sharing and polishing their writing. And James Britton said it this way, reading and writing float on a sea of talk, and wisdom is at the point of utterance. And that means kids have to talk. They need to talk. That's when they become wise, because they hear what they know. They hear what they think. They hear what they're dreaming, because they monitor it when they see it. Dr. Donald Graves tells us that writing is a noisy, messy, frustrating activity. And the book closes with an index, and you have a copy of that page, that shows how very complex writing is. All of these topics and more go into a writing experience, and we've included all of those topics in the 32-page flip book. Writing's tough. Writing is tough. And the recursive truth about writing is that sometimes we have a writing purpose clearly in mind when we begin. Sometimes it emerges as we write. Some writers revise as they write. Some writers edit as they go. They can't stand to write a word that isn't spelled correctly. They can't stand not to put the commas in. They've got to do it as they go, while others focus only on getting the ideas onto the page or on the screen. So we need to respect the arrows that go back and forth in this recursive diagram of uh, the writing process, and we need to accommodate the different writing styles. Writing it, plus getting it right, plus getting grammar right, plus getting sentences right, plus getting spelling right, plus getting punctuation right, equals writing it right. As I wrote at the, or pardon me, yes, as I wrote at the outset of the book to the students, this is not a book that you need to read from front cover to back. Rather, you can go directly to the particular pages you need at a particular time, and the index will help you to do that. For teachers, it offers a quick review, and it might even be useful as a source of ideas for many lessons. In conclusion, I hope that you and your students will enjoy using the book and that you will all find it to be helpful. Thank you.